Hey guys, Frank here and welcome to a new tips video. This one is going to be a little bit longer and I'm going to explain to you why. Today we are going on location with our awesome model and stylist Nadine for some great shots. But the main thing about today is we're going to do it only with two modifiers and one strobe. Join us for today's episode of Digital Classroom. Hey guys, one of the most interesting things, of course, is working on location. You never know what you're gonna get. It almost sounds a little bit like a movie, right? But the thing about locations is that sometimes things are promised that didn't really come true. Like for example, hey, if you come to this location, you have beautiful lighting and then you're on that location and the lighting is absolutely horrendous. Or, well, I think you should bring strobes because the lighting here is very bad and then you are on location and everything is perfect. So one of the first tips I want to give you guys is always bring a strobe for the very simple reason. It's always possible to not use your strobes, but it's a little bit difficult if there's a situation where the lighting isn't perfect to still make something out of it. Now, of course, with Photoshop, you can do a lot, but let's just keep it simple for now. Now, in the past, one of the biggest limitations of location photography was, of course, power. So you brought big batteries with big strobes and a lot of power, 1200 watts, 1100 watts, but you need a lot of power. You might wonder, why do you need a lot of power? Well, when we look at the older strobes, they didn't support something that nowadays we have in even those smaller strobes, and it's called HSS. So what is HSS? In essence, when you shoot with older strobes or studio strobes, you are limited to 125th of a second for your shutter speed. You can go up a little bit higher, like 1 200, but when you go higher, you will see a black bar appearing in your images. Now, by the way, in the future, this probably will be solved because Sony has released a camera that will solve this problem forever. But for now, we are still stuck with cameras that have this problem and of course also strobes that don't support HSS. So you need a lot of power to overcome the sun, because if you shoot outside on 125th of a second, the sun will probably overpower your images if you shoot on 2.8. So you need something that can literally just get you up to f11, f16 or f22. Now with HSS something else happens. With HSS the strobe doesn't fire once, but it strobes. So that means that your shutter curtain doesn't give you that black bar because it's not one pulse, but it's several pulses. But let's not dive into that too deeply for now. So what do we use on location today? So normally again, what I told you, we use big battery packs and big strobes and that's a lot of stuff to carry around and most of the time after 250, 300 fires on full power, that battery will be empty. Nowadays we're using so-called hybrid strobes and in my case I'm using the Chicotos. Now you don't need a lot of power, but you do need more power than a normal speed light will give. Now, normal speed lights will vary from 50 to 65 watts, maybe a little bit more. These are 200 watts and we also have one with a rounder head and a magnetic head and that's 250 watts. But today we're just going to bring the 200 watts. Now if you use a dedicated controller, now in the case of the Gikoto, our own commander, you can steer these strobes in HSS and ETTL, meaning that ETTL you don't have to use a light meter, the camera will literally just set everything for you up and it takes the image. Now that isn't 100% perfect, but if you have to work fast, ETTL is literally a miracle in a box. So you might wonder like, hey Frank, so how did you set everything up today? What do you bring on location? Well, today we're going to take you behind the scenes during a workshop with our model Nadine. Now during this workshop, we have three students and myself, of course, and that means that we take a lot of shots. And a lot of those shots are done on manual. And let me explain that very quickly. During a workshop, we choose the so-called dumb triggers. Now those triggers don't support HSS, they don't support ETTL, but I can very quickly give them to my attendees of the workshop and they can shoot with our setup. So that means that even in manual mode, these strobes will keep up with the sun and that is very impressive. But it doesn't work easily. Let me explain. So let's go to our first location. Now our first location is next to our studio and we're just going to place Nadine in front of some trees. Now in this case of course we want to also include the tree and 
on the bottom part there wasn't a lot of detail. So Nadine actually brought some flowers, put it in the scene and you can see them barely, but they do make the scene look complete. Now, the first thing you will notice is that of course on location you need a lot of light. And if you would use a strobe like this without any modification, you will quickly find out that on full power they will probably do just fine. But on full power your battery also goes down rather fast. So we need a modifier that enhances that light, that gives you more light power. Now the same thing goes as in our studio. You can use light attachments or light shapers. Now for outside I'm actually using this one. <laughs> And this looks a little bit big, right? And that has a reason. We call this the throat of the reflector. Now the deeper this is, the more the light will be focused inside that reflector and then beamed out. So this one will give you a lot more light than for example a smaller one. Now if you're shooting with Hensel, we call that the 14 inch reflector. If you're shooting with Ellingrom, we call that the Maxi Light or the Maxi Spot. If you're shooting with Gikoto, you can get it a lot more cheaper. You just go on AliExpress and you find the biggest one that has a Bowens mount. And it's one of the main advantages of course of the Bowens mount. So this one I believe it retailed for about 30 euros on AliExpress. Now another thing that I love to bring on location and I didn't do in this set is actually our magnetic system. We of course have our Rogue Gels magnetic, we have our grids, we have our omnidirectional dome and of course our collapsible snoot that you can use in four different ways and even squared. And of course if you have a square, um, sorry, a rectangular speed light you also use the converter. But in this case we are using only that big reflector for our first setup. Now you can see I'm shooting from a lower angle to give a little bit more dynamic in that shot and also to include the trees of course. Now, as you can see the results are pretty nice. You overpower the sun a little bit and by changing your shutter speed you can let in more or less available light. And this is something we're going to do in another set. Now also one of my favorite modifications for on location shoots is of course the Frank Doorhoff Flashbender, also from Rogue. So for the next setup I'm using only the Flashbender on the Gikoto GT200. And the nice thing about the Flashbender is it gives you a beautiful light quality. The disadvantage of the Flashbender is of course it sucks up a little bit more light than that huge reflector, which is logical of course. So in this setup, as you can see, we're placing the Flashbender a little bit closer to our model under an angle. And if you play a little bit with the shadows, you can get a disastrous image or a great image. It just depends on where the shadows fall. And on location, it helps enormously to shoot tethered. So connect it to, for example, an iPad, as you can see me doing in the video. So after we did our shoot uh, near our studio, we thought let's go out to a beach. Now, as you can see here, Nadine did bring a lot of stuff. And the idea was to teach the students actually that you can do a lot with storytelling. Now for me one of the most interesting parts about photography is that part of storytelling. It's not just putting a beautiful girl in front of a display or a background or whatever, it's about what happens. Now one of the cool things about working with strobes on location is that you can literally use your shutter speed to change the total look of your images. And that's exactly what we did here. Now we started out with an umbrella that was still working and functional. And as you can see in the images, and I'm going to show you those later of course, I started out with the sky pretty much blue and open. But the more the umbrella broke down, the more I started to raise my shutter speed. And that means that the sky became a lot more darker, but the strobe is still correct. So how does that work? When we're shooting outside, we have two different light sources. You could say we're shooting HDR, and I'm not meaning highly destructive retouching, I'm literally meaning two shots in one. The first one that's really important is of course your strobe. This is a pulse and that's only once. If you're shooting manual without uh, HSS, that means that you can't go higher than 125th of a second, maybe 160th. So that means that the first thing you have to do is determine where do we put the strobe. Now in the past, we used a light meter and preferably a reflective light meter. That means that if you point it to something, you will get the value for 18% gray. And it means that you can easily calculate, open three stops for pure white, close down for about four and a half stops and you have black. But this isn't 100% reliable as in what you're gonna see. So nowadays we're using something completely different. We're going to set up our camera on manual mode and we're going to use the EVF in our camera to determine how we want to look 
at the shoot. So that means that we're going to put it on manual mode. We're going to set the shutter speed to a maximum of 125, and we're going to set up with our shutter speed, uh, sorry, with our shutter speed locked at 125th, we're going to change our aperture until we like what we see. And I give you one tip, make it a little bit darker. So as soon as you see in your viewfinder what you like, and don't think about the model because that will be the strobe, then you will just look at your settings. So let's for example say that you see ISO 100, 125th of a second, and you really like the look of F11. Okay, now set your strobes for F16. And that will be, of course, one stop darker. Now the cool thing about this is that you can always lower your shutter speed. So if you shoot it on f16 and you go like, oh, this is really dark, the only thing you have to do is open up your shutter speed to 1 60th of a second. And now you will get a proper shadow detail and you will probably get the image that you like. Now the reason I'm always going a little bit darker is because if you're shooting with a client, the client often has a different opinion than you. Now, if you shoot the darkest possible setting at 125th, you still have a lot of range to go down. You can go to a 60th, to a 30th, and because you're shooting with strobes, and maybe if you're a little bit stable, you can also shoot on 115th. So down you have three stops range. If you set everything up perfectly at 125th, and your client goes like, hey, I like the backdrop a little bit darker, you have to change your aperture, and that also means that you change your depth of field, and you don't want that. Now there is one thing I have to add about the light meter. Now I told you guys that I don't use the light meter anymore for reflective metering outside and that's 100% true. It's much easier to set it up in your camera and see what you're gonna do. But of course it doesn't mean that I'm not gonna use the light meter anymore because how am I gonna set up the light for f16 or f11, right? We're still gonna do that with our light meter. Only in this case we're using the so-called incident meter reading. So that means that for reflective meter readings, except in the studio, and they're still very handy, there's not a real necessity outside anymore to use a reflective meter readings. Now there's one more thing I would like to add about the use of the light meter. Now most light meters won't support a strobe that is set up on HSS, because it can't meter HSS, because it's not one pulse, it's actually strobes. Now, if you want to make sure that also your HSS images turn out perfectly with your exposure, don't worry, there are light meters that are able to meter HSS. For example, this Psychonic 858D can meter HSS. It also meters your flash duration. So this is actually a very complete light meter. It does reflective metering, incident meter reading, it can do HSS, and it can also show your flash duration. So although we're not using reflective metering outside, it doesn't mean you don't need that light meter anymore. It's still an essential piece of kit that will make your workflow a lot faster, but most of all, it will give you continuity in your work. Okay, let's go back to our video. So, on the beach, we had Nadine sitting down, we had a lot of stuff around her as you can see, and Nadine always has great styling. And the reason that I'm showing you this is also, we're using the same lighting setup, still that huge reflector, but also look at the different positions I'm shooting from. I always try to incorporate some of the scene, but also use close-ups and go down or just go up. It depends on the angle that I want to shoot in. The nice thing about shooting from different angles is that you also get different lighting effects because the light stays at the same location. After we did this shot, and I think you're absolutely gonna love those images, we went to a little house at the same location. 
Now this set, I had a little bit more trouble in finding the correct pose and the correct look. This just wasn't my set and that can happen, right? But you still want to make the best of it. Now as soon as I find a set that I don't find that interesting, I'm starting to look for leading lines. I'm starting to look for really low positions I can shoot in. And as you can see here, we're placing the light under an angle, again that same big reflector on the GT200 aimed at our model. Now with this setup, there is one thing that you have to remember. If you have strong shadows in real life on the floor, make sure that you place your strobes under the same angle as the sun or at least at the same position as the sun. Because otherwise you get two different shadows going two different ways and that looks really, really bad. And even if you shoot close-ups, it just doesn't look right. So when you're shooting outside with only one strobe in the sun and you also see the natural shadows, try to place that light under the same angle or at least at the same side of the sun. So let's take a look at the images from that setup. And after that, well, it was time to go to the forest. In the forest there's something that's really interesting for me and that's actually this bridge. Now when we look at this bridge, the first thing that you will notice is leading lines. I really like leading lines in my shots. Nadine was wearing black and against a wider or lighter backdrop that can immediately give you some troubles that your shadows will clog up. So that means that in this case I'm shooting under two different angles. One angle I'm shooting with the brighter backdrop and one angle I'm shooting with the forest in the back. And as you can see in the end results, the images will look totally different. Now this is something that you have to be aware of. You have to be aware of this before you start shooting. If it's really important that your client sees all the details in the clothing, don't put black against a wider backdrop, but make sure that you put it against a darker backdrop so you can see all that shadow detail. But if your model wears dark and especially with, for example, red sunglasses and you have that light backdrop, you can actually make that dark even darker and make that image pop like crazy, especially with that red sunglasses. The nice thing for you as a photographer is that you dive in and try all those different settings. Give your client something to choose from. Well, let's take a look at those final results. After this one we went back for our studio to get a little bit of a drink and a snack and we decided to also do one final shot next to our studio. Now for this setup, and it's going to get boring and that's why we're going to do it only in one video, we're using exactly that same reflector again. In this case we're using a part of our studio I always call our outside studio. It's actually the part that we never clean up and never give any attention to. And well, the excuse is, well, that's a nice outside studio, right? But as you can see, it's really photogenic. Now in this case, there's a lot of junk in the back. So that means that we're shooting from a lower angle up. And also here, I'm experimenting with different shutter speeds to let in more or less available light. Now if you find out that the images are a little bit too dark, in Photoshop or Lightroom you can always lighten up certain areas with your adjustment brush of course. But in this case we let it the way that it was. Now in the end I did shoot a few images on ETTL and HSS to show the attendees what you can do with a shallower depth of field. Can you spot those images with a shallower depth of field? Well they are a little bit harder with this setup. But trust me, when you are shooting alone and you can shoot HSS because you don't have to change triggers. HSS and these smaller strobes are absolutely awesome because you can shoot outside, kill the sun and still get a very, very shallow depth of field. Now after this workshop we did a lot of photos. We shot mostly on manual, but because we're using that big reflector, I didn't have to shoot on full power. And it actually meant that with three students, myself, shooting and explaining everything, the whole workshop was done with only one battery. And when we came back in the studio, we still had one block left. 
Now that's very impressive because that's something I could never pull off with those big batteries. So those hybrid strobes, you can put them in your bag, you can bring them with you very easily. A flash bender always fits in your bag and well, you can shoot all day on just one battery. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Digital Classroom and the tips. If you want to see more of these smaller tips or segments from our workshops with explanation, leave your comments below. And if you have any questions about lighting setups or workflow, also leave comments below and maybe you will see your question answered in the next episode of Digital Classroom. I'd like to thank you so very much for watching guys. Like and subscribe and tell other people about our channel so we can grow. Keep shooting and see you next time. Bye guys.